ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you could turn to Haggai. And uh, I was trying so hard. I wanted to finish. See, now I'm going to tell a little story so you have time to find Haggai in your Bibles. Uh, I was so hoping and wishing that I could finish the Old Testament uh, before we kind of take our summer break, and it's not going to happen. I'm going to have one book left over, and uh, just in how it was working out, I'm like, maybe I'll just summarize Zechariah, but man, I've already started delving into Zechariah, and I'm like, I can't, I can't short sight uh, Zechariah. There's too much great stuff in there. So we are going to spend uh, the rest of our time here before our break, which is going to begin June 15th. And so we'll be here on Wednesday nights in our, in our verse-by-verse study uh, and our you know, prayer and study time here on Wednesday nights until June 8th is our last one. And then we're going to start our family night barbecues. And so looking forward to that. Um, I think we're going to have Tacos Cholitos out for that first one. And hey, there's nothing wrong with using the table of contents, okay? That is okay to do. You have my permission for those of you who are still rustling around. It's totally fine. Uh, but I think we get Tacos Chilitos to come out again, so it's going to be great. Looking forward to those times together. And again, it's the, the the larger that this organism gets, the more important it is to have these times where we're spending time together as a family, and that's what's going to make this. Uh, the, that's what makes this time so valuable as we get to know each other that way. But that's what's going to make these summer barbecues again so important for us to get to know family, hang out with one another, just being together. So, hope you guys can can make it out there. As I said, Haggai, I hopefully I've given you enough time to find your way. It's just really a few pages left of Matthew. Haggai's name means the feast, and, uh, and so many folks believe that perhaps he was born on one of the major feasts. No one is exactly sure, but that when we read about the feasts in the Old Testament, his name comes from that same root word, okay? And then as you may have noticed in your ability to find the book, it's a little shorter, it's small for some of you, perhaps it's just, you know... On pages that are together, it's so small, just two chapters. And, you know, anytime we're starting a study, making general observations is really helpful in in wrapping our mind around a book. And that's a little easier to do when the book is small, like Haggai. And so one thing that when you can notice pretty quickly about this little two-chapter book is the amount of dates that are used. Haggai um, provides dates six times. He tells us, here's the date. Here's what happened, you know, when the, this happened. Six time he do, times he does that in these 38 verses. And so if you take notes and that fascinates you, you're going to have an opportunity to write those down uh, because uh, I'll tell you what they are. In verse 1, right off the bat, he tells us, in the second year of King Darius, uh, or Darius, in the sixth month on the first day of the month. And then uh, I think we have, a, did I make a slide for this? No? Okay. I'll repeat them all a couple times. Um, so 1-1, one, one, and then in one fifteen, just 23 days later, he says in the 24th day of the, again, sixth month, still second year of King Darius, and then in chapter 2, verse 1, another month later, he says in the seventh month, in the 21st day of the month, and then in 2-10... Two months later, he says, on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius or Darius. And then in 2.18 and 2.20, he repeats that same date again. So again, that's 1.1, 1, 1.15, 1, 2.1, 1, 2.10, 2, 2.18, and 2.20. All told, if my math is correct... Haggai's ministry covers less than four months. In fact, 114 days. 
Now, one of the things that we've heard over and over again, if you've been with us through this portion of the minor prophets here, was the warning of the Babylonians coming, this future captivity uh, and exile that's going to take place at the hand of the Babylonians. And it did take place exactly as the Lord said it would. And so... um, This is going to play into the book of Haggai. We're going to go through a timeline here from uh, where we were in Zephaniah, essentially, to where we are right now by the time we get to Haggai, because some time has transpired during this. Now, Babylon became the world power in 605 BC. They defeated Egypt and Assyria in one of the most famous and important battles in world history, the Battle of Carchemish. And it was at this time that Babylon came and they took this first wave of captives with them from Judah back to Babylon. They took all the young princes and future leaders, this group in 605 BC that was deported back to Babylon included Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and then Judah years later, again, rebelled. They were subjugated at that point to Babylon. They rebelled again. And uh, in 597, Babylon again exerted its power and they took a second wave of captives. And they took the king this time, who was a man by the name of Jehoiachin. They took Ezekiel and again, many other young, influential, leadership, entrepreneur type people with them back to Babylon just trying to just take the will out of this feisty group of Jews who didn't want to be subjugated to the Babylons. Now, the Babylonians replaced Jehoiachin with his brother, a man by the name of Zedekiah. And Zedekiah was the very last king of Judah, but he also rebelled against the Babylonians. And this resulted in the third and the most devastating invasion by the Babylonians. And by the time they left, the walls were tumbled, the, the temple was decimated, and the, all, all that was left in the land was the very poorest people. The houses were, were, were crushed, all of that. That took place in 586 BC when Judah was finally completely defeated by Babylon. So three waves of exiles, 605 BC, counting down 597 BC, 586 BC. And then as I mentioned last week, these last three books of the Old Testament are called the post-exilic or post-exile. It's after those exiles. And so All the other um, prophets, except for Daniel, uh, are before the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Uh, But these last three books of, of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi take place after the Jewish people have returned again to Babylon. And so Haggai himself probably returned to Jerusalem in the the first set that came back from captivity with uh, with Zerubbabel, with Zechariah, with with, with those. Joshua was the high priest. They took about 50,000 others with them. That was in 538 BC. And we do have a timeline for this that we can put up if you want to get these dates down. I didn't share it, did I? I could, you know how fast I can do that, though? It's pretty amazing. So maybe I did share that other thing, too, and I didn't realize it. See, that's what I get. I deserve this. Let's see how fast it can go from my phone to uh, up there. Is someone timing me? My job's already done. Now I'm waiting on them. No, I've seen you. <laughs> I see you guys writing furiously. I'm like, well, it's going to be. Oh, it's not up there. That's my bad. Okay, so this 50,000 or so is all that returns out of the whole nation that is led captive. It's just a small portion that actually does return. People got comfortable in Babylon. And so they came back 
to this land that was decimated in 538 BC, and they started to rebuild the temple. They recognized that, hey, we're God's people, this is God's land. They start to rebuild the temple. But in 536, just two years into this project, there's some opposition that we read about in Ezra from the neighbors. There's some indifference to the people. We've gone so long without it. Why do we really need it anymore? And so they kind of pack it in, and that's pretty amazing. Aren't these guys incredible? Thank you, Mr. Eddie. And, uh, and so they just kind of move in on their lives. And then 16 years later, in 520 BC, the Lord sends specifically Haggai and Zechariah to the people and commissions them and says, you have got to get back to doing what God has called you to do. You, the people as a whole as you know, like a monolith were led to Babylon. Some came back and then they just got comfortable. They're not making the things of God important. And you'd think they would. You'd think they had learned their lesson. But 16 years go by. And so the message of both Haggai and Zechariah, as we will see, is that it's time for you to get back to what God is calling you to do. Now, if we were to go over to Ezra chapter 6, verse 3. 15, we would learn one more date, and that is in 516 BC. The temple, it says in Ezra 615, was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius. All these other dates that we had before were in the second year. So just four years after the book of Haggai, construction is completed. And that's one of the things that he was, he was a successful minister, prophet of the Lord in that regard. He encouraged the people and they did what God was asking them to do. So he's effective. And then uh, I also have an outline now that we just got all those dates up there. Uh, I have an outline and maybe I can, you can flip between the two to give folks a chance because that was on me. But uh, here's an outline for you to just help again with observations as we go. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, it's going to be an an encouragement to consider your ways to the people. Man, you got to evaluate your life, consider your ways. And then in verses 12 through 15 of chapter 1 is the response of the people. So consider their ways, the response of the people. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, is God's promised glory. And then in chapter 2, verse 10 through 19, consider uh, your own holiness. And then uh, and the book finishes with the promise of Messiah. So while you guys are jotting that down, I'm going to begin. Chapter 1, verse 1, book of Haggai says, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, I was thinking about this, and I'm, I'm so glad that um, we picked the names that we do. Like Joshua, that's a good, that's a good Bible name. But man, Shealtiel and Jehozadak, man, I'll give you 50 bucks you name your kid Jehozadak. That's impressive. No, I won't. Don't do it. That kid, it's worse than, you know, a boy named Sue. Okay, verse 2. Back on track, I promise. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says... This is what the people say. The time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. And so the Lord is just repeating their attitude back to them. Out of the abundance of their heart, he knows their heart. Hey, here's here's what I'm speaking. That you're, You're saying it's not necessarily time to do the Lord's work. And so the people, the problem is identified right off the bat. The people are content to procrastinate. They're not against doing God's work. They're not opposed to doing God's work or having it done. It just wasn't a priority for them. And that we can tell that by that timeline that we had. 16 years has passed. 16 years in which they could have been doing the work and nothing has happened. And so, uh, and, and again, 
this hasn't always been the case. When they first came into the land, there was some general excitement about, hey, we're back in the land, these 50,000 guys that came back. Let's do what God called us to. It says in Ezra chapter 3, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple, the priests, this is Ezra 3.16, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively praising and giving thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever towards Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But that was then and nothing has happened since. The project has been abandoned for 16 years, and the temple is in ruin. You know, some of you have maybe seen some property, a house that got started, the financing fell through or something, and just it's just, it's a, it's, there's nothing there. It's all brambles and weeds, and there's, it's, it's gross, right? It's hard to make out even where the property, the foundation was supposed to be, and that's what's happening here. The, the last 16 years, it's not that they, these people didn't have priorities for their life. We all have priorities. That's something that everybody is given is priorities. They had to-do lists. They had goals. They had things that they wanted to accomplish for their life, things that they made time for, but they weren't the Lord's things, and the Lord was calling them out on it. And this is one of the questions, one of the things we can certainly learn as we go through the book of Haggai. Has the Lord been speaking to me? Has he been telling me something? Has he been pointing to an area of my life that needs addressing, that I've been ignoring? And we say, it's it's not time right now. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. That's just not important enough for me to address in my life. And and the encouragement that we're going to have, the application that we're going to make from this old book of Haggai is, is there some service? Is there some fellowship? Is there some area of prayer? Is there some area of bitterness? Is there something God is speaking to me that I'm just, I'm saying not now. I enjoy where I am without that change in my life. Man, don't wait 16 years. Don't have this book of Haggai so closely represent your life. Address it. That's what, that's what Haggai is telling you. He's a reminder to align our priorities to the Lord's priorities. And so they, they're saying, God knows it. He knows their heart. It's not time to be about God's business. And then, verse 3, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? And this temple to lie in ruins? So the Lord says through Haggai, is it, it's not time for the Lord's house, but okay, are you saying it's time for your houses? Because you're dwelling in these paneled houses or these covered, finished houses, the, the houses where all the millwork is done or something, right? Where, where that's all completed. He says, so, so where's your priorities? You're, you're addressing your house, but not mine. And so the Lord just says plainly in verse 5, Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. I want you to think about this. I want you to examine your life. I want you to consider where you're putting your efforts, your time, your talent, your treasure. Examine your life. Examine your priorities. And what are you valuing? Okay? Just think about that. And then I want you to consider where that's gotten you. He says in verse 6, you've sown much and bring in little. It's almost like this is, if you'll consider your ways, this is what you're really going to find. And you're working hard. You're sowing much, and you're bringing in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, and he says again, consider your ways. Consider the fact that essentially he's saying, by all intents and purposes, they're living in relatively luxurious places. They have nice houses. They have paneled houses. They have food to eat. They have stuff to drink, clothes to wear. They have a paycheck. They are earning. He says, you're well taken care of. You have all that you need. You have shelter and sustenance and clothing and all that, yet you feel broke. 
Because you're, you're putting your money into this wallet that has a hole in it. You're, all, you're, you're still living paycheck to paycheck. You still have all of this. Because really, you, you, you think, of like, what I, you have what you need, but you never feel like it's enough. There's always something more if I just have this. Now, there's multiple ways in which to apply this verse, I, I uh, just to make some application, you know, to, to where we are, because we're not in the process of building the Lord's temple, right? But it is about priorities. It is about financial things and giving and all of that. And so I remember years ago uh, when I was on staff at the Calvary on the other side, and someone called the church and said, hey, we noticed that the youth room needs some new sofas. And so we'd like to drop some sofas by. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing. That's great. You know, that's going to be fantastic. And so uh, they come by and it's, okay, we've got some new sofas. So here's our old ones. And, uh, you know, this one's got a stain on it. That one's got a hole on it. But if you put covers on them, they look pretty nice. I'm like, okay, well, they look pretty nice in your house. Like, why are you giving this? To us? Not that that can't be a blessing to pass along furniture, but uh, man, like, is it is it okay to give something nice to the Lord? You know, and so that's some application uh, to be made. There's nothing wrong with giving the Lord something that's nice and new. But on the flip side of this, this verse is often used to manipulate people into giving. And, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a, of a building project, and I'm, I guarantee you this is not going to be plastered all over the wall of a theme verse for our church that everywhere you turn, you're going to see you live in a house with siding. We've got an empty lot back here. Think about that, you know. We're not going to do that. How dare you fix your toilet when our roof is leaking, you know. And so this verse can be misapplied. But the passage is, it is what it is. This passage is about priorities, it's about getting right with the Lord. Are your priorities in order? Every part of your life. Because this isn't a, a book about are you attending church or going to, to Bible studies. It's, hey, are you giving? I mean, that's what it's about. Are your priorities represented in all those facets of your life? And it's, it's just about making sure we have that right priority. And that's, the, that's what Jesus tells us too. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Focus on the Lord. Focus on him. Seek the kingdom of God in your life and in your relationships, your job. Other parts of your life are going to go better. That's what the Lord says. And so what's easy for us to do, all of us, is to seek the other things we get caught up in the things of the world, and I'm going to seek the other things, and I'm going to hope that God's righteousness and his kingdom is added onto my life. But what we find, and some of us know this by experience, the more you go after those other things, not that they're inherently evil or wicked or bad, that's not what these people's problem is. This isn't a book about idolatry. It's just priorities. But the more you go after those things, the more we, the more I go after those things, the Jesus gets pushed in the back. But the call throughout the Bible is seek God first before all of these other things. And the other stuff in your life is going to align. Just talking with Chris earlier, you know, it's being in rhythm with the Lord. Our life is in rhythm when we're seeking him first. And, and we all know what it's like to not have our lives in rhythm, right? We've felt that. It, doesn't, it, just, it's, it just doesn't feel right. Not that we're not getting on in life. Not that we're not doing okay. It's just not in rhythm with the Lord. And so what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, the book of Haggai, get your life in rhythm. Have it be and your priorities be where it should be. And so he, the Lord's pointing out you, you have, but you, you just, it never feels like you, don't, you have enough. It's because you're not prioritizing. It's not that you're not earning a paycheck. That's not the issue. And so this is their lack of pursuing God and prioritizing is affecting every part of their life. So twice he says, consider your ways and how you have been. And then also, be careful with your ways going forward. Verse 8, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. It says, you're, essentially, you're taking pleasure in and glorifying your, your own house 
well, I'm not receiving pleasure and glory in my house. Now, glory is a word that is comes up a few times in this book. We're going to read a lot about it when we get to Zechariah, the glory. But in the Old Testament, that word glory is a really unique word. It means weight. It means weightiness. It's, it's, it's worth. It's got some value, some substance. Uh, I heard someone recently say gravitas. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's the idea, you know, is giving God that. He's like, yeah, there's weightiness to it. And now some would say, if I'm going to talk about the critic here for a little while, I would say, what a weak God. What kind of God gets upset when he doesn't get enough attention? When he isn't noticed enough. Oh, you need to give me more weight and give me more value in your life. A God that demands to be glorified has got to be such a, a weak God. But we need to remember that God, and this can be how we answer people when we hear that, God wants to be glorified because that's what's best for us. When he is exalted and given value and weight in our life. God wants my life, your life, to bring him glory, not because he needs that. It's because we need that. I need to be reminded of who God is, the weightiness, the authority, the value that he has in bringing him worship and doing that. And that's when my life gets back in this proper rhythm. That's when things become as they, they should, is when he is elevated as the authority instead of me. When I begin to think it's me instead of him, that's when things are out of order. And so God reminds us of the glory, reminds them of the glory he deserves to realign their priorities, and that's what they need. It says in verse 9, You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. All that stuff in verse 5, I'm the one that took care of it. the food, the shelter, all of that stuff. I, I kind of kept it from you because you're, you're, that would increase this misplacedness that you have on your priorities. It's kind of like if the kids come home and they say, you know, the neighbors were giving away kittens. Look what I have. You know, I have this thing. And you'd say, well, you may have brought that home, but I'm not allowing you to keep it. Not, I'm going to blow it away. That sounds a little weird, but that's kind of what the Lord is saying. You're taking stuff in, but I'm, I'm restricting you from having that because it's going to allow you to continue in this mindset that you're okay without me. So you brought it home. I blew it away. Why? Asked the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that is in ruins. Well, every one of you runs to his own house. The supplies... This is, seem to be going to their own houses before the Lord's houses. Now, again, there's some cross-referencing here between Ezra. It'd be a great book to read uh, in the meantime. But Ezra 3.7 tells us that, that 16 years before, cedars of Lebanon, this, this best timber in the world, was brought down from Tyre and Sidon. But here, God says, go up to the mountains and get some wood and start building. Okay, what happened to that timber? That was brought down, that really good stuff, 16 years ago. And the implication is here, they used all that good wood on their own home. It's like you, you run to your own house with this. Therefore, verse 10, the heavens above, with, above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Now, Here's what's interesting. Hebrew, there's some, a little bit of a play on words here. In Hebrew, in verse 9, it's literally, my house is in ruins. And then in verse 11, I called for ruin or drought. The real word is ruin. I called for ruin on the lands and mountains. So my house is in ruins. Now your place is in ruins. It's kind of like, you, you, you made my place desolate by neglect. I'm going to make your place desolate by neglect. The judgment fits the crime. Now, verse 12, here's the response of the people. So that's the, that's the issue going out, and the response is when Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, 
obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the presence of the Lord. So first thing that hits me in this, in, in verse 12 here, is that even the leadership had their priorities messed up. Zerubbabel, he's the governor of the land. C- civically, he's in charge. Joshua, religiously, is in charge. He's the high priest. But here, they began to obey. Haggai preached this message, and all of them, from the top down, obeyed. We're going to get back to what God is calling you to do. We, we recognize, we did consider our ways. And now we're going to get back to what God is calling to you. And it says they feared the Lord, they had this rever- reverential awe for him, fully uh, aware of his authority in their life. They're obedient, they're reverent. Verse 13, and then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I'm with you, says the Lord. I can't tell you, we can read by, through this so quickly, but how much this would have meant to these people. They haven't had this kind of insurance, assurance from the Lord for decades after decades. They just got back from captivity. They abandoned for 16 years what he was calling them to do. But as soon as there's one mark of obedience in their life, one one decision in the right direction, the Lord says, I'm with you. He doesn't say, I'm with you later on. He doesn't say, I'm with you. Oh, because now you built the temple. Now you restored the altars and the sacrifices, and you started doing what I've called you to do. No, they're not even there yet, but their hearts are there. Their hearts want to do the things of God. They've made a decision to glorify God in their hearts, and the Lord says, That's what I'm after. And now I'm with you. Verse 14, this is so good. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, stirred up the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and stirred up the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came, and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month, In the second year of King Darius, the people determined to follow the Lord, obey him. They feared him. And the Lord responded to that decision. I want to honor God. The Lord responded by stirring up them, by stirring up the civic leader. Oh, how great that would be. By stirring up Joshua, all the people. And now they're motivated Now they're getting after it. Man, God has stirred us up. We've made this decision and and now we're ready to go. They want to do the work because God did a work in them. And that's always the way it is. Philippians 2 verse 13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God puts the will to do something in you. God just doesn't command you and say, go serve, go build, give, do that. He puts the desire in you to do those things. And so God will stir you up to do the things that you maybe never wanted to do. And every once in a while I hear about people who's like, man, I'm, I'm scared about going on the mission field. God's going to make me go someplace I don't want to go. That doesn't happen, you know. I don't want to go to Papua New Guinea, and I just know exactly that's where God's going to put me because I don't want to go. That's not how God operates, right? And so initially, they didn't want to for 16 years. They didn't want to give and serve and build. But in hearing God's heart and considering their ways and reevaluating their life, Oh, now they have the will to, they have the desire to obey God, and God stirred them up to do the work. Chapter 2, and in the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Same group, about a month has passed. Lord says, here's what I want you to say to those very same people I stirred up. Who is left among you? who saw this temple in its former glory. And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not your, in your eyes as nothing? These guys are so us. Maybe I just, me. Priorities get messed up. They get sidetracked. 
Lord just impresses on you, consider your ways. They hear God's heart. I want to walk in obedience. God stirs them up. They do well if you're keeping track of the time. They do well for a while, a month or so. But now they need some more encouragement. It's just this ongoing thing. The work is hard. It's not all sunshine and rainbows. As we read through Ezra, we realize there's real challenges in this. It's hard. People are difficult. The task is demanding. Ministry isn't easy. It's a challenge. It's tough. It's not what they, they had some expectations that were askew. It's not what they thought it was going to be. And so that's what they're experiencing. What they were comparing what they saw with the past. He says, who remembers that? You old timers, you guys who were here, you know, when Solomon's temple was still around. And now you see this, this meager temple one month in. Remember what Solomon's temple was like? Oh yeah, it was amazing. It was taller, wider, brighter, more valuable, just better. Man, we always get into a danger, especially in ministry, but we always get into a danger when we begin to compare. Look at their ministry. Look at how God is using them, their gifts. Look how God isn't using them. Look at their past. Look at my past. All of that comparison, that discontentment, it brings discouragement. But then notice this. God, this is just such a great passage because that, that just, just describes me. Right? I can do well and then get discouraged. Not too long after, the Lord says, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel. Man, he failed for 16 years, this guy. Now he's done well for one month. <laughs> now, now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Oh man, this is such great stuff. Be, first of all, be strong. Be strong. Be strong three times and work. Okay, I want you to be strong and I want you to work. Why? Because it's about my presence. It's not about the building. We've covenanted. We're, we're in this together I'm with you, and my spirit remains on you. This is the source of all, all ministry. And, and so if you fear me, if you're with me, if you're in this covenant relationship with me, you don't have to fear. Don't fear anything else. So be strong. Let's get to work. Don't fear. I was with you, and when you came out of Egypt, I'm with you when you came out of Babylon. For thus, verse 6, says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth and sea, and dry land. Now I believe that Haggai is looking all the way into the tribulation. He says, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire, notice the capital D, of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord says, don't you worry about the temple's glory. The day is coming when I will shake the nations. I will fill this place with glory. I've got the glory covered because the desire of nations is coming. That's a, that's a way to speak about Jesus. Jesus is coming. And the temple, this temple that they're working on here in Haggai, it would be built in four years, but it would receive a major overhaul by a man by the name of Herod the Great, but it's this temple that Jesus was dedicated at. It's at this temple that Jesus sat there on the steps and asked and received questions from the high priest or the, from the, the, the elders there when he was 12 years old. It's from this temple that he healed and that he, he taught and he touched people, he interacted with people. He came here. And it's this spot that a future temple will be built. And Jesus will rule and reign again. He'll rule the nations. He'll shake the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. In verse 8, he says, The silver is mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. 
You're, you're comparing, considering how good things used to be. I want you to focus instead on how great things are going to be. Guys, this is true of us too. The very best things in your life are yet to come. They're, they're the things of eternity, the things of the future. And that's what he's doing. Again, let's set your priorities. Let's be looking there. And so don't be anxious about provision. Gold's mine, the silver's mine. Don't worry about that. You walk in obedience. You continue to fear me, be in that relationship with me. I'll take care of the glory. And now the Lord asks them to consider, again, their holiness. He says, on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, and I want you guys to listen to, to what's being said here. You got to focus on, on, on this. It's really great, though. He says, ask the priest, saying, verse 12, if one carries holy meat or the sacrifice that's been given to the Lord in the fold of his garment, he's just Got in his lunchbox, we'll say, okay? And, and with the edge, he touches bread or stew, wine, oil, or any food. Will it become holy? And the priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, verse 13, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? If he touches food, if any of this stuff. So the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. And then Haggai answered and said, so is this people, so is this nation before me, says the Lord, and so is every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. The Lord says, I'm going to bring glory and righteousness to the temple, but I want you to be holy. This needs to be a focus and a priority of your life to be holy. And so he instructs Haggai to present these two questions to the priests. Question number one, if there's a sacrifice, something that's been offered to the Lord, it's holy, and it accidentally touches, it bumps into something else on the, in the lunchbox, does the other thing become holy as well? If this is holy and it bumps that, is that holy? No. Okay, question number two. What happens to someone who has touched a dead body and their by become ceremonially unclean, and they then they touch something. Is that unclean too? Well, the answer to that is yes. Okay, and so in other words, what he's saying here: you can you can pass on uncleanliness and pollution and wickedness and and sin, but you cannot pass on holiness to someone else. This is a great message for the church today. Something that we should remember and listen to is that just being in church, just having parents that follow the Lord, being you know, surrounded by believers, going on a Wednesday night, studying through an Old Testament book, being around com people that are committed to God doesn't make you committed to God. Going through the motions isn't enough. You need to be obedient to the Lord personally. That's his message for them. It's his message for us today. You need to, to have your priorities in order. You need to be committed to God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's, it's what you'll do. You're not going to treat this relationship like a checklist but you're going to do those things if you love me. And so he says, you need to have that heart of obedience. You need to keep that desire going in me. That, Lord, I want to live the life you're calling me to. Stir my heart again. Do it all over. It's great. You can't pass on holiness. Now, verse 15, carefully consider from this day forward from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, but there were but 10, and one came to the wine vat to draw 50 baths from the press, and there were but 20. The Lord says, I've allowed this up and down in your life. I've allowed you to have some expectations be shattered. 
when you place your trust in physical things, verse 17, I struck you with blight and mildew and hail and all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. The Lord says, it was me. I was the one who, out of my grace to you, didn't allow you to be satisfied with less than me. If I would have let you have the, the 20 ephahs uh, of grain, if I would have let you have the, the 50 baths of wine, you, man, all, I, I restricted that and so that you would turn to me. But he says here, you did not turn to me. And so, verse 18, consider now from this day forward, the same day, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, Consider it, he says again. Listen to what I'm saying. From this day forward, from now on, consider and know that that blessing comes through obedience to me, by giving your life to me, by following me. Consider that. Consider that that's where blessing is. You want to hashtag blessed life? Consider the fact that it comes through obedience to Jesus. Verse 19, is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive oil have not yielded fruit. But from this day, I will bless you. From this day, you've committed to me. You're walking in obedience and holiness. And now from this day, I'm going to bring the blessing. Verse 20, and again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th, the same day of the month, saying, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, you really dropped the ball these last 16 years. I think that maybe what he would have been expecting, he's like, I see how the Lord has just responded to our hearts, wanting to be obedient, how gracious he has been. He stirred our hearts. He's equipped us. There's blessing involved with this. And now for 16 years, I've dropped the ball. But he didn't hear that. The Lord says to Zerubbabel, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them, the horses and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I've chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. All this, again, speaking of this far future day and, and the day that the, the Lord reigns. And so when he says here, I'm going to make you like a signet ring, a signet ring was this symbol of authority. It represented the one in authority. And the Lord says, That's going to be you. You're going to represent, be a picture of the ultimate authority. I've chosen you for that. And Zerubbabel did have an important role in the coming of Messiah, in the coming of Jesus. If we were to look at Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, we'd see that the last common denominator in both of their genealogies is Zerubbabel. That the, the, the bloodline of Mary was through Zerubbabel, and the legal line of Joseph was also through Zerubbabel. And so he says, that day is coming, and you're going to be a picture of that, what what I've done in your life. And so the last bit of application that we can have through Haggai, some of these Old Testament books, some of these minor prophets can be a little bit of a, a chore to get through, but you can't get more practical application, I think, than we get in the book of Haggai is that day is coming. Nations are going to be shaken. Thrones are going to be coming down. Militaries destroyed. But here's what you need to do. Here's what we need to do. I need to do. Have your priorities right with the Lord. Don't put off obedience. Don't say, I'm going to wait 16 years. Because we, we don't say that, actually. What do we say? Tomorrow. And we say tomorrow for 16 years. That's what they said. And so if there's something that you have just, Lord's impressed upon you, something that you've been putting off, don't say, ah, that time is not now. That time is today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this super practical book of heaven.